Hello, homebrew Christianity deacons. This is Trip, and this is a John Cobb episode of Homebrew Christianity, the barrel aged edition. That's right. John Cobb, the world's greatest, foremost, most inspirational, and this is not just coming from me, it's coming from, uh, I'm pretty sure Jesus agrees, most inspirational, uh, processed, church-loving theologian, an articulator of the living and life-giving God, an advocate, early advocate of um, of ecological consciousness in the faith, a um, a, a man who has uh, captured... Uh, the the theological insights of Alfred North Whitehead and Charles Hartshorn, and connected them to um, his, his his Methodist tradition, uh, the scriptures, and the heart of faith. And today, uh, since it is Advent, and we have been pulling out right with these barrel aged podcasts, these oldie but goodie episodes, we are bringing back John Cobb's first visit to the podcast when we talked about the incarnation. See. It's fitting because, you know, um, it's, 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 it's Advent. We're looking forward to celebrating the incarnation, the coming of God in Christ. And why not, as we go nearer to uh, Advent, uh, to reflect on it with some amazing theologians. And we have, we have three more coming your way before Christmas. But in order to get these barrel age podcasts, these four to five-year-old epic interviews with some of the best theologians on the planet, you need to go subscribe to the Homebrewed Christianity Barrel Age podcast stream. This is the last one that you'll get on Homebrewed, the normal interview stream, uh, because there are you know eight or nine hundred of you that have been subscribing to these podcasts for four or five years, um, but there's thousands of you who weren't weren't deacons back in the day. You joined the ranks, and you just can't find these uh, these interviews easily from 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 all all those years back. Well, we're editing them. We're gonna have short intros, update the uh, sound quality because uh, after four years, you finally figure out how to uh, up, upload the volume so that you can hear it while doing something else. Um, and and share them here on the Barrel Age podcast stream. So right now, you know, go over, subscribe to the Homebrew Barrel Age uh, podcast stream on iTunes. Give us a five-star review. Tweet it, Facebook it, share it, because we don't want anyone else to miss any of the exciting Barrel Age podcasts that are coming up, coming out soon. And uh, we're going to have a bunch of incarnation ones as we get near Christmas. We're going to talk to a Catholic theologian. We're going to talk to... um, uh, a, a Calvinist. We're going to talk to John Cobb today. You see, like, this is going to be a bunch, a bunch of incarnation thought right here. And you don't want to miss that out. So go subscribe to the Barrel Age stream. And when you go to the podcast page, uh, remember, you can click an Amazon link, get yourself a nice little uh, John Cobb book for Christmas, maybe to give it to your favorite nerd. And when you click and get anything on Amazon, doesn't change your shopping experience, but if you click through our links, then we get a little kickback. You you know you we share the brew, and then uh, you share a little bit of your uh, book purchasing money um, with us just by clicking the links. See, we can be friends that way, and then we can keep extending the bandwidth and bringing more resources, more interviews, and more stuff for you to brew your own faith. All right, now let me introduce you to John Cobb. You know. There's three JCs here at Homebrewed Christianity. One, Jesus Christ, because it's Homebrewed Christianity. Two, it's Jack Caputo. But the thing is, uh, I mean, I love Jesus and I love Jack. But you, you know, deep down in Tripp's heart, there is a wild passion for John Cobb. Because I'm not just a fan of John Cobb. I don't. I don't. I'm not just a maniac when it comes to you know, just reading through his text and thinking through him, and then meeting him and finding him this amazing, generous, kind person. No, no, I'm not a fan. A fan. I'm not a maniac. I'm a faniac. That's right. Faniac. Faniac. John Cobb. Boom. Chicka 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 chicka. So enjoy his first visit to the podcast, um, and uh, and tell your friends. All right, brew on. Hello, homebrew Christianity listeners. You are in for a treat today because I am sitting in the office 
of John Cobb here in California. And um, now you, through the wonderful gift of the internet and audio files, get to join us for a conversation about uh, Christology, Advent, Incarnation, and whatever else comes up. John, thanks for joining us. I'm very happy to converse with you. Well, um, is there is there a particular place you want to jump in? It's Advent's coming up, and people will be listening to this during Advent. And and as a theologian, what about Advent attracts you the most in um, uh, in your in your life? Well, uh, I suppose if you say in my life, then having grown up in a a, a typical Christian culture of my time, the excitement of Advent was that Christmas was coming. And Christmas meant an awful lot of things. Some of them were very profoundly theological, and a lot of them were not very theological. We probably want to talk more about the theological ones. Yeah, well, some of the things that aren't theological end up with having theological consequences. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid some of the theological consequences have been to produce a counter-religion to Christianity, which we call consumerism. And that consumerism is the first truly global religion. Well, you heard it here first. Consumerism is the first truly global religion. And it has has an even better um, witnessing technique than, than Christians have ever come up with probably about a witnessing technique, and uh, it has a lot of money power behind it. Yes, that is its uh, res- best resource. Um, what, what about, what about Christi- uh, a Christian theological uh, understanding of Christmas and Advent uh, puts it in most strong conflict with, with consumerism? Well, I suppose it would be that through the doctrine of incarnation and the idea very closely associated with incarnation that it is Jesus who reveals God and also reveals to us the norm of our own being and living, we have a message that is profoundly opposite to consumerism. The idea that even God acts to serve us rather than primarily seeking our service. And that for us to follow Jesus is to seek to find ways to serve the neighbor. And then when we ask who is the neighbor, it is the one who is in greatest need. That's very different from trying to get hold of as many consumption items as possible. Mm-hmm. In uh, leading up to Christmas, the, the whole season of Advent, the church, the church practices together uh, waiting and anticipation for the coming of God's hope and peace uh, and love. Um, what about the season of Advent uh, do, are you drawn to as a, as a process theologian? Even though we believe that uh, in Jesus we have something that is final in many senses, and we can talk about that extensively, we also know that the world we live in is not the world that we would like to live in. Mm-hmm. It is not the world that God wants us to live in. The... Um, Kingdom of God, or I prefer to use other translations of Basileia Theu, is here only in anticipation. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the mood of, of Advent, which is one of waiting and anticipation, is not just something that we experience for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's one of the dimensions of the Christian life, always. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the emphasis in in process theology is God's involvement in history and the world, and and one of the things you throughout the gospel narratives that are focused on in Advent and 
um, the look at Isaiah and the different prophets. And what they're waiting for and calling us towards is us participating with God in history. Um, what what is so what is important about waiting as opposed to just going? What do we learn in the act of waiting and anticipating that we wouldn't get in just five sermons in a row of do this right now? You're asking very subtle and important questions. Waiting is not probably what most of us are best at. We, we have the sense of the importance of making something happen right now. But on the other hand, we're not going to make happen right now what fully needs to happen right now. So that the, the recognition that we live in light of what may be, of what God wants to be, and of what we long for without actually experiencing it and not not really exp- ex- ever expecting to fully experience mm-hmm. it is a style of being in the world that many people find extremely difficult. I think one of the uh, distortions of that can of Christianity itself is when people expect that if only they have enough faith or act in certain ways that are demanded that somehow all problems will disappear, Mm -hmm. their lives will find fulfillment. One of the attractions of some other religious traditions is that they suggest that there's the possibility of becoming, well, if we take Buddhism, the, the language they would use would be enlightened, but there is the possibility of being fully enlightened in this lifetime. Not all Buddhists would say that, but there Mm -hmm. are those who... And people are willing to pay a very high price if they think they can get that kind of total fulfillment. It's um, So the the accent on waiting, if it does not turn into passivity, uh, is... It's very important, but all of these emphases can easily be distorted. Yeah, yeah. Um, the in Advent, the you know, you're lighting the candles and and waiting for the coming of the Christ Child, and um, that it brings up a lot of questions about the incarnation and and that the different emphases and ways of describing how God was in Christ. And what God was doing in Christ and why this Jew in the first century and that place with those parents and um, and why those different stories are all these kinds of questions. Uh, what what kind of way do you enter into the discussion about incarnation and, and, and then how does that end up influencing the way you understand um, uh, Christmas and, it, and our celebration of it as a as a church? Well, the notion of incarnation, of course, is the idea that God is actually present. Mm -hmm. And very often when Christians talk about the incarnation, they think almost exclusively of the way God is present in Jesus. Mm -hmm. But throughout the history of the church, there has also been a sense that God is present in other people. Yeah. That God is present in the world, that God is present in life. And... uh, so the instead of saying that God became incarnate in Jesus, I think we can say that God has always been present in the world, that the world would not exist without the divine presence in it, mm-hmm. and that this presence is uh, always a calling alluring and empowering, strengthening, at least when we're talking about the presence in human beings. So the, the idea of incarnation as such is much more comprehensive than the Christology. But without the Christology, meaning now specifically how we understand Jesus, the idea of incarnation would not have grasped us and become important to us. Mm-hmm. So it works both ways. We need a, a way of thinking of how God is in the world in order to understand how God is in Jesus. But it is because of our conviction that God is in Jesus that we see God in the 
in the world as a whole. So, so what kind of um, what you're talking about is that as a as a process theologian and and other other Christian theological traditions hold this too that the world and God are not completely separate, and then all of a sudden the incarnation is a divine invasion into a specific person. But prior to the coming of the the coming of Christ, there God is involved in history and in the world, or in the in the Jewish story, and um, and even in the lives of Mary and Joseph, and uh, and the other Jews running around in the first century under a Roman oppression. And then in those kind of situations, there's always the possibility of 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 incarnation occurring. And then at the same time, we see that because as Christians, we see uh, a particular um, uh, revelation of God in the person of Jesus. Is that? I think you're saying it very well. And, and revelation, the, the notion of revelation sometimes appeals more to the mind and is talking about what makes us know about God. Mm-hmm. But it's important in Christianity to say what makes us know about God is the actual presence of God. Yes. Not information about God. Mm -hmm. So we actually experience God in Jesus, but we can also experience God in our neighbor. Mm -hmm. But sometimes uh, people think they experience God in what happens in history, in ways that that don't stand up when we put them alongside of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So... We have a norm by which we decide when what is incarnate, what what we are experiencing there is truly God. We may make mistakes, but we are not totally without guidance. Mm-hmm. And I know that there, some some Christians hearing this could could be just generally concerned that you would take the notion of incarnation and then apply it to God and the world generally, uh, and and they would think then what is the particularity of Jesus without it being mm-hmm. exclusive. Um, uh, can you talk about that and maybe sure. how there are some bad assumptions behind uh, that question, that that just that you can't have God involved in the rest of the world without the particularity of God's work in Christ? Well, uh, as a process theologian, I think as a theologian who takes the Bible seriously, Mm -hmm. I'm going to insist that certainly God is related to everybody and not just to those who are believers and that there are people in every tradition who are responsive to what God calls them to do. So Mm -hmm. we're not uh, wanting to dismiss the universal working of God in order to emphasize Jesus. But being able to say those things is easier, much easier for us, and and I would say is mandatory for us, precisely because in Jesus we have the kind of presence of God that is that separates the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Then we do have then the, the the theoretical question of what do we mean by saying God is present in anyone and what kind of presence that it may be in different people, and how we think God was present in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And at that point, even though people don't like the word metaphysics, I would say we have to have some notion of the nature of reality in order to talk about how God can be present in something else. And at this point, as you you certainly know, process thought, as a different metaphysics from the one that has underlain a great deal of Christian theology in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's best to begin by saying what it is that we don't agree with before we try to say what it is that we do want to affirm. In the uh, classical period, Christians tried to formulate a way of thinking of how God was in Jesus, and that was the focus. And in doing so, they brought a Greek notion of ousia, which we usually translate substance. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to the, the Latin already translated it that way. And if you start talking about substances, 
One of the first things one learns is that one substance cannot be in another substance. Now, of course, you can have a page in a book, but you cannot have a page in a page. The pages exclude one another. They're necessarily external to one another. So if you take that as your model of reality, there really cannot be an incarnation. And uh, if you see how the church fathers struggled with the doctrine of incarnation, you see how difficult that made it for them. Mm -hmm. Again and again, they thought the only way of affirming God's incarnation in Jesus was to say something that would be present in other human beings was lacking in its human form in Jesus. Mm -hmm. You might say that Jesus did not have a human soul. It was the, the soul of Jesus was divine, or the reason of Jesus was divine, or the will of Jesus was divine, and so forth. I'm very happy to say that the church as a whole in its decisions never acknowledged, never went that route. Mm -hmm. they insisted Jesus had all the characteristics of a human being. But if it, in that case, how can the divine substance be present in this human substance. That's the metaphysical problem that they wrestle with. And because they didn't really have any way of dealing with it within their metaphysics, it ends up in paradoxical formulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I like think... Like in, in the Chalcedonian Creed. It, it's, it has a paradoxical element to it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's called mystery the other other ways of saying it, but it, it has, I think, made it more difficult for people to be Christian when they think they have to, have to affirm something which they cannot understand the meaning of. Mm -hmm. Now, we process folk think that, that we should take events and experience, say something like a moment of human experience as being the kind of thing of which the world is made up. We're encouraged to do that by modern physics or contemporary physics, but we won't, we won't go into that <laughs> channel. That would be a bit too much for, for this discussion. <clears throat> but if I analyze my experience in a moment, I see that almost everything in that experience comes into that experience from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. A lot of it comes from my past experience. It flows into the present. So rather than saying... Two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. We'd say thousands of things are occupying the same space at the same time. And uh, then we can discuss what in all of that, in my experience now, where is God? Mm -hmm. And that God is really present in my experience now is not a violation of the way one thinks sensibly. It's... It's almost required by it if you believe in God at all. Mm -hmm. So for process theologians, there's no difficulty saying God is in the world and in every creature in the world, and certainly especially in human experience. So God is incarnate in that sense in everything. Then the question comes, what's distinctive about the way God is incarnate in Jesus? And there are many people who think the difference is simply that Jesus was more responsive to God's calling, much more, maybe mm -hmm. ideally responsive to God's calling, whereas most of us are only fragmentarily. I don't think that's a bad way of thinking, but I'm not satisfied with it myself. So I've spent some time thinking about the the many different ways in which God can be present in a human experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the, the easiest way to talk about that is, well, it, it isn't easy, it's, it's some, somewhat difficult, but let's say that uh, most of us experience God as judge, as giver of life, as call, sometimes as demand. But in all of those ways of thinking of God, we are setting God over against ourselves. We're making a distinction. Mm -hmm. And that distinction between oneself and God 
is a very natural, appropriate, and generally valid one. But the, uns- the, the startling thing when we read the Gospels is that, although I think there are times that that same kind of dis- distinction can be found in Jesus' understanding of himself and God, there are times when when Jesus' own selfhood seems to be constituted, at least in part, by God. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a deeper level of incarnation than I ever experienced, that Paul, then Paul claimed. You find something sort of like it in some mystics, but I, we spend a little time on that. I think we'll find that the mystical experience is quite different mm-hmm. from, from that of Jesus. So, I'm inclined to the view that Jesus is a unique expression of incarnation. And this is important because the, it gives an, a kind of authority to what Jesus says, the way he saw the world and how he expresses the way he saw the world, that we don't find in others, and this has been true, the people we most admire in later Christian history never, never claim to put themselves on a level with Jesus. We may think St. Francis is a marvelously sensitive, perceptive, devoted Christian, mm-hmm. and maybe was just as faithful to God's calling as Jesus was. I, I don't think we have to say that no one else could be as faithful to that calling as Jesus was faithful to Jesus' calling. Mm-hmm. I think, however, that Jesus' calling was a different calling and required a different relationship to God. Well, I, I think Jesus was called to be and do something that other people have not been called to do and be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in that sense, the calling is unique, but the, 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 when you connect it to the distinctive form of incarnation, I think it's that the, the calling of Jesus involved his, his very selfhood being constituted mm-hmm. in part by God's presence. And uh, after you've come to these conclusions and then look back at Christian tradition, um, what parts of it stick out to you as uh, of places where you have companions where you're wrestling with mm-hmm. uh, same, the, the kind of same issues and things? Well, of course, so much of the, in so much of the early church and the creeds, they were wrestling with how to say that um, Jesus was significantly constituted by the divine presence mm-hmm. in him. And I think I'm trying to answer the same question. I feel companionship. I feel the, the frustration of the usia idea uh-huh. that they took from the Greeks, not from the Bible, of course, and how it prevented them from saying what they want. Now, the point at which I've, I'm distressed about what happened in Christian history is the period after the last of the creeds, of the ecumenical creeds. Mm-hmm. See, the last of the ecumenical creeds, some people were saying, well, Jesus is like human, like us, except the will of Jesus is divine, not human. And the, the, when they got together to discuss it, they said, no, Jesus had a human will also. So again and again, I have a lot of appreciation of the fact that they didn't succumb to what would have been a logically, for them, given their metaphysics, it would have Mm -hmm. been more logical to have come out the other way. But what distresses me is that in both East and West, in the centuries after the Creed councils were ended, they evolved the idea that there is no human person in Jesus. They began talking about the impersonal humanity of Jesus. I think that's not what, that was not a correct understanding of the trajectory in which they were thinking. Mm -hmm. But it came to be thought of as orthodox. Mm -hmm. And I think that Jesus was a fully human person. He was even more 
more fully personal and more fully human precisely because of God's presence. Mm -hmm. The more God is present in us, the more human we are and the more personal we are. And their inability to say that and to think that, I believe, has done Christianity a great deal of harm over a long period. In in a couple different books, you've talked about the way um, uh, some of those Christological conclusions led to a kind of uh, uh, theological absolutism yes. in the church, and and you wanting to move beyond it or help the church move beyond it, uh, while avoiding a relativism that's sometimes associated with with liberal Christologies. I I think it might be helpful first to. Um, give your criticism to um, relativism, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then turn to absolutism from your perspective. So I'll criticize relativism first, and absolutism afterwards. Yes. Well, there is with Christmas bells in the background. <laughs> well, obviously there are forms of relativism that are absolutely true and never mm-hmm. to be doubted. Each of us sees the world a little bit differently because we've had a different life experience. And and how we perceive one another and think about issues is always relative to who we are, when we are living, who our companions are, what books we've read. So let's first of all agree that we live in a relative world in that sense, and that's part of being creaturely. Well, it's it's one of the ways God avoided boredom for humans. (laughs) Yes, that's good. (laughs) Okay. But there is also what I call a debilitating relativism, Mm -hmm. which says because no one of us has the absolute truth, everyone sees things a little bit differently, there is no truth. Mm -hmm. Or or truth may be whatever the largest number of people agree on or something like like that. To me, that's extremely destructive. Mm -hmm. Truth is truth. The world is as the world is. And God is as God is. And none of us has knows all of that. But the fact that two people see God in different ways and see humanity in different ways and see salvation in different ways may not mean that if one is right, the other is wrong. Mm-hmm. God is multifaceted. The world is multifaceted. We are multifaceted. And people experience of reality, maybe of different features of reality. The example that I think is religiously, historically most important is well illustrated in the difference between Christianity and Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Buddhists seek enlightenment. Christians seek salvation. Now, I understand by salvation the coming of the Basileia Theu, which I like to call the divine commonwealth, but mm-hmm. it's usually called the kingdom of God, and I want to be sure people understand what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Uh, the By no means all Christians uh, understand salvation that way, but in terms of Jesus' message, that's fundamental. On the other hand, Buddhists are seeking individual enlightenment. And enlightenment is very profoundly understood as a realization of how things really are that transcends all conceptuality and leads one to be wise and also leads one to have compassion for all things. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing, but it's very different from the Basileia that Jesus is speaking of. Now, for one to be right, it does not make the other wrong. A lot of people, I believe, who have been maybe not totally enlightened, but have had the kind of experience Buddhists are talking about and find that an extremely rich and important experience. The Basileia that Jesus was speaking of, we're still waiting for, as we were talking about earlier, but nevertheless, there are... There have been and are today many communities in which the quality of life, the quality of human relations <clears throat> that the Basileia points to are realized in sufficient fullness that we can talk about having some anticipatory realization 
Mm-hmm. And that's what Jesus talked about at his time, too. That was in his table of fellowship. That was an anticipatory realization of, of the Basileia. So here are two messages, very different. But for one to be, for us to give ourselves with enthusiasm and total personal commitment to one with the confidence that, and its truth does not mean that this says something negative about those who give themselves fully to the other. Mm-hmm. Now, it's my opinion, my prejudice perhaps, but from my relative point of view, it is more possible for us as Christians to also assimilate the wisdom of Buddhism than it is for Buddhists to assimilate the wisdom of Christianity. That's the one way in which I would say we have a fundamental advantage. But the number of Christians who take advantage of their advantage is rather small. Mm -hmm. Most Christians through the years have tended to say, since we are right, they are wrong. That is by no means taking advantage of this opportunity. And and how does um, our understanding of the Incarnation help us avoid that kind of absolutism and uh, uh, ignorant rejection of the other without, without even getting to know them? Well, I, I think if we do understand that God is present and doing different things to different people, God may have called Gautama to spend the years of meditation that led to his enlightenment. Mm-hmm. And he may have been just as responsive to God's call as St. Francis. So uh, to, to suppose that God has not being, been doing anything of enormous spiritual importance anywhere except in Israel and among the followers of Jesus, to me is totally antithetical to the notion of God's mm-hmm. incarnate presence in all things. So as, as we as a, as a church near Christmas, um, what, what about uh, a process understanding of the incarnation uh, calls us to experience Christmas differently as individuals and as a church, or, or what kind of challenge does that theological vision um, uh, make more imperative to, to a Christ follower? Well, if it is really uh, Jesus that we are waiting for in incarnation, then all the questions you are asking, of course, are very personal and very intimate, because... Our culture is so profoundly alien. Well, of course, the culture of Jesus' day was alien to what he was saying. Mm -hmm. It was dominated by the Roman Empire, and although Judaism provided much that that Jesus incorporated, and Jesus was a Jew, no, no question about that, probably just because he was a Jew, He was more critical of the limitations of the Judaism of his time. No more critical than we should be of the Christianity of our time. But the the temptation to care more about pleasure, success, power, sexual enjoyment, and on and on than we do about what Jesus reveals to us as being most important in the world is going to be present, I'm afraid, as long as there are human beings like us. Mm -hmm. But the wonderful thing is that in spite of that, there are many thousands of communities, many of them, not all, many of them are congregations in which people really relate to each other with genuine love. No effort to, or little effort. I mean, I I don't want to suggest we have achieved perfection anywhere, but nevertheless, there are communities in which people are not trying to gain advantages over one another, but really 
relate to each other in supporting ways and accepting ways and allowing each person the freedom that that person needs to respond to God in his or her way really happens. And to be a part of a community like that gives meaning to life and a deep joy. That is possible now. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us and uh, and sharing with us. And uh, hopefully since I live here, I won't be pestering you through my experience at Claremont. Uh, we'll 